For 30 years, this man performed more exorcisms than anyone else, serving as the go-to demon hunter for the Vatican. He even allowed a Hollywood director to film one of his battles with darkness. His life is also the subject of a new horror film. But is this renowned evil fighter the real deal? This week's episode is The Pope's Exorcist, Father Gabriele Amort. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. What a time we've had researching this one. <laughs> My mom walked in when I was, which sounds like she lives here, but she was being very nice and ran an errand. She said, can I run by the house? And I said, yeah, sure. I'm just working in the living room. And she rolls through and I was watching footage of an exorcism, alleged exorcism. And she's like, what the hell? I'm getting out of here. And I was like, mm, that's probably smart. I had to um, pause my work because I was also watching the same exorcism in our living room. And then the children got home and I was like, okay, well, this going to just pause this for a minute take a beat. so yeah we so much so often i have to do my work in the bedroom and it's because i can't have ella seeing all this yeah, she'd have some questions she'd have some she questions. would and um you know i have some questions too after watching it quite frankly but i will say when the recorded exorcism we are going to speak about much tamer than I was anticipating. I think so. I think this is uh this whole episode is myth busting exorcisms. <laughs> I've learned Speaking more. Of Mythbusters. Did they redo that show but with two new people? I think they rebranded it. I learned okay. some, did I learn on Reddit that the original hosts like weren't friends and didn't like each I, other? I think I told I read Would something about that? how Somebody they didn't me. yeah, they had a lot of like infighting and off screen they did not get along. Devastation. Whenever mm. you're best friends with someone, lean into it because they could have shared fun hats. But instead they were they could have. Yeah. I don't know if they were really best friends. But I saw a commercial yesterday and it was all about myth busting something. I think it was like detergent, but it was two different people, but they kept saying myth bust so much that I was like, clearly this is a take on myth busters. It has to be. But it was a guy and a, a guy and a girl. So that all that to say, we're going to bust some myths and Everything. maybe dispel some, yeah. maybe concur with some. Everything you thought about exorcism and detergent was wrong, it turns out. <laughs> Uh, we've got some announcements before we get to that, yes. though, including, oh my gosh, it's April 12th, the day that this is released. In one short week, we're going to be flying to Denver and Salt Lake. We've got some shows on April 19th. We're going to Denver, Colorado. There are a few tickets left. Get yours before they're sold out. Salt Lake City, we're going to go on April 20th. And uh, there are also a few tickets left for that. I think the VIP is sold out in both locations, but... You can still get general admission. It's They're both really great venues. You'll feel mm -hmm. like you're right up close uh, with us, and we'll tell you all there is to know about the moon. And I've been learning <laughs> some fucked up shit that uh, I haven't even told Christy yet. I got oh. deep last night, and I said, Damn. I got to come over. We got to talk about it, and we got to add it to the script because interesting things. Have come, new shit has come to light. New shit has come to light. I'll tell you what. I got in deep last night, too, down a... Zillow TikTok rabbit hole. Whoa. That has that? taken me places. Gosh, I got to come over. We got to get on the porch and talk about yeah. it. <laughs> well, uh, come over tonight. I will. And then we're gonna, what we're going to do is then in the Q&A, which is an intimate 45-minute post-show Q&A for those in the VIP, you can ask us anything, including what was up with a TikTok rabbit hole? What I want to know the Zillow stuff. We'll oh, show you the yeah. TikToks. Whatever. We'll talk about them. If anything you live you in Zanesville, Ohio, you're probably already aware. You're already on it. Well, yeah, we're going to Denver, Salt Lake, uh, Austin, Texas on April 27th, and we're going to Houston, Texas on May 3rd. So those are the next four dates. 
Tickets available now at SinisterHood.com slash live shows. All tickets for all cities. All cities are listed or on sale except Pittsburgh. We're still waiting. We should get those in the next few days. Pittsburgh. 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 We love you. <laughs> it's also kind of far out, so I get it. So, But we're yeah. trying to get the link. It'll be on Patreon first. But SinisterHood.com slash live shows. And we're going to see you somewhere on the road and talk about this it's weird stuff I learned about the moon. I can't wait. I'm very excited. You know what else is happening and on? I'm excited for some cool weather. I hear it's pretty cool oh. in uh, Colorado and Salt Lake right now. So I think it's extremely, extremely cool in Salt Lake to the point of uh, snow. So <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> mind, we're going to get a little well, snow on. I, we rarely get it, so I always think it's fun when we travel to places like that. So I'm excited. We're going to get snowed on. Yes. Also... I'm excited for we have been nominated yeah. for best comedy podcast for the Webbies. We're up there with Stephen Colbert's podcast, Dulce yes. Sloan. Josh Johnson from The Daily Show. Yeah. Latinos Out Loud. Comedy Do we have banging? a chance? Probably not. <laughs> but can you go vote for us? Absolutely. And we would love it if you do. Voting ends. On 420, at 11.59. So what better way to celebrate 420 than by throwing a vote our way? You can go to where, Heather, to do that. You go to SinisterHood.com slash Webbies for a quick link to vote for us. And if we win, we get a five-word acceptance speech. And we, uh, if will we win? Who knows? But if we do, we have uh, made a vow to you that we'll let y'all vote on what five words we say. Anything goes, whatever you want. And we'll put uh, the McGruff puppet in a tuxedo, but only if we win. <laughs> and frequently people have showed we're in third place, which honestly shocks me. But if we can make it to third with your help, listener, we can probably make it to second. And maybe even if you're holding out, we can make it to first. So sinisterhood.com slash Webby's and uh, we'll do it together. That's how voting works. That's you just right. go up the ranks. <laughs> right. We all, I think together or our five word speech should be, Eat my shorts, Stephen Colbert. Oh, just kidding. I love you, love Stephen it. Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll be like Stephen Colbert. I uh, thanks for last night. Wink, and then Wink. ruins everyone's lives. Mine yeah. is my whole career. <laughs> yeah, never mind. I won't say Speaking that. Speaking we'll of Stephen Colbert, he is very Catholic, and this episode is very Catholic as well. It is. So. Uh, I have my uh, Saint Benedict bracelet on. Oh, just in case. You know what? It never hurts to have it. <laughs> I have I'm looking around. What have I got near Your me? Your studio. Your office is full of all kinds of whimsy. It's, it's real wild right now. I got a furry Chewbacca journal within arm's reach. I believe um, you, don't you have the Viking skull? Yeah, that's Viking right here too. Save you. We have yeah, Viking skull. I'm protected. I got a lot of crystals in here too. So <laughs> and holy water. So I think I'm good. Oh, done and done. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Gabriele Amort was born in Modena, Italy on May 1st, 1925. An only child, Amort described his parents as warm and affectionate. They were his role models, whose love for God and each other set a powerful example for the future demon fighter. He knew from age 10 he was destined for the priesthood, according to the book The Devil is Afraid of Me, The Life and Work of the World's Most Famous Exorcist. Listen, he didn't, you know, hold back on giving himself titles. I always say, if you want people to look at you a certain way and address you as such, then you got to start putting that forward. If you want to be known as like a comedian, you just have to start saying, hey, I'm a, yeah, oh, I'm Christy, I'm a comedian. And then, you know, people start looking at you like, if you want to be known as the world's greatest exorcist priest, then you got to start calling yourself that. It's all about branding and messaging. Yeah. And he knew that early. Beginning in 1939 at the age of 14. Amort was educated at a Jesuit boarding school in his hometown. Jesuits are a worldwide society within the Catholic Church, committed to the promotion of justice. His teachings in justice were put to the test when he was drafted into the fascist army during World War II, but went AWOL before joining the Italian resistance. The college that I spent one semester at in New Orleans, Loyola, was a Jesuit school, and mm -hmm. it was all about justice. How are we going to fight for other people, watch out for other people's rights, not letting people's rights get stepped on. So I imagine if you're raised in the Jesuit tradition and then it's like Mussolini's like, anyway, we're about to join up with the Nazis and oppress some people. You'd be like, I don't, that doesn't jive with what that I learned. That doesn't ring well with me. Yeah. yeah. 
By the age of 20, he was serving in the resistance at high ranks and was awarded a Medal of Valor at the end of the war. His father and grandfather both lawyers. Amort followed in their footsteps, obtaining a degree in law before attaining a second degree in theology. In 1951, he was ordained as a Catholic priest. And he did a little bit of political work, I think, too. But it's one of those where you're he had wanted to be a priest anyway. So you're like, I'll try this on. I'll try. You know, you go from war to politics. But you're like, that I want to like fight. a natural progression. <laughs> and then you're fight. like, you know who the biggest battle is against? Satan. The devil. That's where I'm going. Yep. In his early days as a priest, Amort spent time traveling to sites that were attributed to miracles of the Virgin Mary. He brought a sacred statue of Mary back to Italy. Is it Pio or Pio? Pio. He brought a sacred statue of Mary back to Italy to the famous priest, Father Pio, later canonized as St. Pius. Pio was the first clergy member to share firsthand experience with Satan with the young Amort. Having himself survived an instance of stigmata, Father Pio also told Amort how Satan had taken form as a slobbering black hellhound to attack Pio in the night. And this was, I think, very, it left a big impression on Amort because if you have a fellow priest being like, I've literally fought the devil in the shape of a dog and mm. I've had the actual stigmata happen to it, you would be more likely to believe that stuff, I would think. Oh, I assume that he was a mentor and a role model. So someone in a higher position that you respect says that, absolutely. For the first half of his career, Amort worked as a parish priest and chaplain in various locations in Italy, including Rome. Through this role, Amort became acquainted with Father Candido Amantini, the only sanctioned exorcist in Rome. In June 1986, at age 61, Amort met with the Catholic Church's second-in-command in Rome, a man named Cardinal Poletti. When the Cardinal asked Amort if he was familiar with Amantini and his practice, Amort said he was. The Cardinal then slipped Amort a piece of paper on which was written Amort's official appointment as Amantini's assistant and apprentice. I mean, you love it. They're like, come in my office. Oh, yeah, what's up? So you know the guy that fights Satan all the time? Yeah. Well, that's what your job is now. <laughs> there you go. What I've always found really fascinating about the priesthood is that some of the biggest accomplishments or milestones come later in life than most jobs would. I mean, he's 61 at this point when he's a like, they're like, okay, it's not like you're on your way out of this job at 61. You're ramping up for like the next big step of everything i mean you see the popes they die you know on their on their throne i don't think yeah. they sit on thrones but like you know pope mobile <laughs> the pope mobile but i mean they it's a lifelong job i mean some yeah. of them start you know he started in and catholic school in his teens and you know you say this is what i want to dedicate my life to but you're right 61 some of us would think of like oh that's retirement age or like mm -hmm. okay well now i had a long career now i want to focus more although maybe for him he's like i had a long career as a priest now i want to, my real passion devil hunting <laughs> and that just goes to show never give up on your dreams that's right they always say like harrison ford was a carpenter before he landed his role and you know you're never too old to be doing what you really are meant to be doing you know like yeah vera wang they said she didn't design her first dress until 40 and john mm -hmm. ham they need to add father amor to they father do. amor didn't even fight his own demon alone until he was 61 there's hope for all of us <laughs> For the next six years, Amort shadowed and worked alongside Amantini, whose health was waning in his final years. Finally, in 1992, Amantini passed away, and Amort was officially the chief exorcist of the Diocese of Rome. Wanting to share his knowledge with others, Amort founded the International Association of Exorcists in 1994 to provide training in the craft to other priests. Get me a badge and get me in that <laughs> convention, because they meet twice a year, I think. Well, I believe that's not going to happen for a couple reasons. And one of them is you're a woman. That's true. <laughs> They're not I, don't, I don't think that women are allowed to do this. No. Nope. Um, I am not Catholic, so I don't want, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that that's correct. 
I'm not Catholic. I dipped my toe in. I spent some time in the Catholic Church, almost converted, but it involved a lot of classes. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'll just show yeah. up. Can I just show up and say I'm in? They're like, no, we have some requirements. I was <laughs> you like, you got to well, do some stuff. It's been nice knowing you. Thanks for, thank you for uh, the one time I accidentally took communion. I apologize. Oh, really? See, I went to uh, an Episcopalian school, which is like a more lackadaisical form of Catholicism. Catholic from, light. Yeah, Catholic light. Diet. From, it was diet Catholic from K through 8. So I took communion multiple times. Well, actually, I think we just had Eucharist once a week on Fridays. And then also if I had to go to church. So once one to two times a week, I was getting the body and blood of Christ. Yeah, no big deal. Yet. I didn't. I was supposed to just get the blessing because I'm not. I wasn't in. I oh, didn't yeah. have my card yet. But then... Father Ernie had to go back to the Philippines. His mother was ill. And so the bishop came and the bishop was giving communion. And I tried to do the X for no cookie mm -hmm. across my chest. And he, he misunderstood. And he went to shove the body of Christ in my mouth. I didn't want to spat it out in front of everyone. So bad I took luck. it and everyone gasped. Yeah, they know. Everyone knows <laughs> if you spit communion, it's bad luck. Yeah, you have bad luck for seven years. If you spit the body of Christ on the not. floor of the church, you better not. I always thought it was cool because I was like, I'm drinking some wine. Hey. I'm like 10. <laughs> well, I didn't drink the wine because I like they like everybody in the church knew me because I had been going with my best friend. And so once they kind of gasped at the cook at the wafer, I was like, OK, I can't I'm not going to push it. But then the bishop's like, you're not going to. And I'm like, it's a we'll talk afterwards. You got to wash it down, though. It's oh, dry. Those right. wafers are dry. It was dry. I know. But I made also. A Tasty. Okay. I remember being, I would be like, gosh, I'm so hungry. Oh, good. I'm about to get the get body of Christ <laughs> tied me over a tiny bit. Do you like, I don't recall it because I only had it that one time, but I envision it's kind of like those nut thin uh, blue diamond almond crackers. <laughs> kind they're of like tastier plain. than that. The nut thins to me are, they're too, they're too dry. But yeah, it's a little, um, I would say a little more wafery. Okay. And a nut then not quite as crunchy. But then some places do bread. Like oh, nice. there would be like, I don't know what they got back there, a baguette or some shit, or just a <laughs> loaf, and they're like tie tearing off little pieces of bread. Like I remember going to Baptist churches with friends, and because Baptists don't drink, it would be um grape juice instead of wine. We so, didn't even do any kind of communion you know? at the baptist church i went to it was just stay in your seats and stand up and dance but there wasn't yep. snacks or drinks except for afterwards there were crock pots in the in the fellowship hall those are the best the Dude. church crock pot potluck afterwards yeah oh yeah so many potato salads deviled eggs just shit like that that i love you, you can't call them deviled eggs <laughs> There's eggs. Yeah. The Lord's eggs. Yeah. There's the Lord's eggs. Like when everyone refused to, not everyone, idiots called <laughs> French fries freedom fries. Exactly. <laughs> My freedom fries. Mm hmm. Sinister Hood will be right back. What happens when you get all sweaty? Oh, I've been telling you. My eyes been twitching. I've been getting muscle cramps. I looked it up. I'm not getting enough electrolytes. I got to get more electrolytes. How do I do that without drinking 80 gallons of water a day? I'm going to drink my element. That's how you do it because you do, we can de deplete ourselves of electrolytes so easily. And also you and I both sweat a lot. <laughs> I was sweating today sitting on my couch. Yeah, it's that's a bad. It's not hot outside today, really. It's just I I'm a sweaty person. But what do you do when you do that? You reach for the element. You do. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt, but no sugar. It also contains science-backed electrolyte ratios with none of the junk. No sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. When you sweat, you lose sodium. When sodium isn't replaced, it's common to experience muscle cramps and fatigue, also eye twitching. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs, and it's used by everyone from NBA, NFL, and NHL players, Olympic athletes, Navy SEALs, to people like me, everyday moms and dads, and exercise enthusiasts. 
Well, if you want to find a great way to rehydrate yourself, try Element totally risk-free. If you don't like it, just share it with a salty friend and Element will give you your money back, no questions asked. So you have nothing to lose. Right now, Element is offering our listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. This is a great way to try all eight flavors or share Element with a salty friend. Get yours at drinkelement.com slash creepy. This deal is only available through our link. You must go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash creepy. Element offers no questions asked refunds. Try it yourself at drinkelement.com slash creepy. In Amort's estimation, a great majority of people are possessed due to a spell, upwards of 90% of cases. Amort told an Italian journalist, the remaining 10 to 15 percent regard persons who have participated in occult practices, such as seances or satanic sects, or have contacted wizards and fortune tellers. He explained to La Republica magazine what he looks for when seeking out the devil, describing the Prince of Darkness as pure spirit, invisible, but he manifests himself with blasphemies and afflictions in the person he possesses. He can remain hidden or speak in different languages transform himself or appear to be agreeable at times he makes fun of me asshole Rude. <laughs> i read an article today that described father mort as looking like a friendly tortoise and i'm sorry but it's true and he's he's got a very warm and welcoming face about him but he also looks a bit like a cartoon tortoise he does he's a he's a especially in his older years Ball headed, just sort of, uh, yeah, cartoonish, but sweet. Seems to have a very fun, ironic sense of humor. Playful. Everybody said, mm -hmm. yeah, it was playful and silly. And so him saying like, oh, the devil makes fun of me. I'm sure he t he kind of took it in stride or whatever. I'll say this. He doesn't look like Russell Crowe. Not even a little bit. Not even <laughs> a small amount. Does he? They're both no. human adults. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. They're both people. And that's yeah. about where the similarities stop not even in his younger years did he look like russell crowe no interesting casting choice yeah and i don't think russell crowe's italian so he's another not. interesting casting choice <laughs> i'm gonna fight the devil <laughs> is he yeah. australian yeah i saw the coliseum he might be from new zealand actually i apologize russell crowe but he's got an accent i just know it from south park <laughs> make fun of him so much of your knowledge comes from south park Honestly. <laughs> oh, wait. It's not going to be open yet when we're there, no. is it? Casa Bonita, okay. it's coming in May. Yeah, we're going back in May. So. We're going to Denver. Just for that. <laughs> for mm -hmm. the grand opening of Casa Bonita. Who I'm probably going to need an exorcism after eating there, quite honestly. We all will. <laughs> we're all going to be casting out some demons for quite a long time in the bathroom after yep. that one. <laughs> Amort proceeded carefully when called in to treat a possible case of possession. He wrote in his book, An Exorcist Tells His Story. Often we're faced with situations that leave us perplexed. This is because often, in the most difficult cases, we're faced with individuals who are afflicted by both evil influences and psychological disturbances. In these cases, a psychiatrist is a valuable help. And he did seem to respect medicine and psychology and psychiatry and would tell his the people that would come to him, he's like, all right, but who have you seen first? I'm like last resort. Mm -hmm. I think that that's um, the way it should go. You got to make sure that you're covering all your bases because it could be problematic or dangerous to try and perform something like this on someone who has a legitimate, you know, mental health disorder that they need medication for. Yeah, I mean, it's good to see a, not only just an exorcist, but like the lead exorcist kind of stay in his own lane and having this society of other exorcists and be like, this is how you should do it. You should make sure that they're seeing medical professionals, make sure they're seeing psychological professionals so you don't have people going rogue and like tying somebody up for weeks and months at a time and torturing them and stuff like that when yeah. really they just have a mental health concern. During the exorcisms, Amort would put more docile patients in armchairs and more robust patients would be tied with either tape or belts when a more would recite the verses of liberation from the roman rite of exorcism demons would spit spew and shriek and the devil is afraid of me a mort wrote of a time he came face to face with satan during his very first solo exorcism 
When he asked a young man who appeared with symptoms what demon was possessing him, the reply came, frightening and in English. I am Lucifer. Well, that's the boss fight you've been waiting for. That's right? the, that's you you beat the game after that one. <laughs> you come right out of the gate and it's <laughs> straight to the top. You didn't even have to fuck with any henchmen Mm-mm. immediately. It's just Lucifer speaking it's at you in English. Literally baptism by fire. Right. As a mort recited the holy verses over the possessed As a mort recited the holy verses over the possessed man. The demon resumed his shrieks making the possessed turn his head back and his eyes roll. He remained like this with his back arched for a quarter of an hour. The room became extremely cold and ice crystals formed on the windows and the walls. Then the young man's body stiffened so much that he became hard and began to levitate. For several minutes, he remained hovering three feet in the air. It took several more sessions, but Amort eventually ridded the young man of Lucifer's grasp. As for the young man, according to Amort, at the end of this, he felt new and light. That's some Ghostbuster shit when they're floating above the bed. That's sounds like it's straight out of the Exorcist movie, which right? we will talk about shortly. But yeah, I don't know that I'm equipped to handle something like that. No, and I will. I, I give credit to that bishop that William Friedkin interviewed in the documentary. And the bishop was like, I'm not qualified to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, I wouldn't even. And, you know, it, being even high as, in the ranks as you are as a bishop for as long as a career as that implies, that level of, you know, ascension applies, that having that humility of like, I'm not even strong enough to do that. Like, I'm not trying to. What do I do if somebody's levitating in front of me? You're like, oh, close the door. Call yeah. more. I don't know. And no, I was impressed by that too, as was Friedkin. He, kind of belabors the point with the <laughs> with the bishop and wouldn't let him just talk. I was like, just let him talk about what it is. But he was, you know, like it's the diocese wants the holiest of holy because it's dangerous. And he said, I would be afraid I wouldn't want to go there because I think it's dangerous. And I think, you know, I'm not the person to do that. And it takes a lot of self-awareness to be able to admit something like that to to be able to admit a possible weakness. So I applauded him for that. Right. To be like, it's not me. No, I'm not the one for that. We all have things we're good at and things that we call in somebody else for. That's when you call in father or Mort. My old coworker, he goes, she used to say when someone was bad at something, she was real positive and she'd go, he just needs to find his place to shine. <laughs> and she's from East Texas. So I'll, I'll say that if somebody's kind of, you know, you just need mm-hmm. to find your place to shine. For a That's more- all we're all trying to do. When called into any case, the first step a mort would take was to confirm that the person truly needed an exorcism. Signs of a possession could vary, but sometimes included sharp stomach pains, redness in the whites of the eyes, and the inability to stop making offensive, sour comments. Others emitted a strong odor of smoke or sulfur. Some experienced auditory or visual hallucinations, insomnia, or muscle pains. Other cases involved extreme sensitivity to religious objects or mentions of sacred figures, speaking in Latin, tongues, or other languages foreign to the possessed person, and displays of great physical strength. Well, as a stoner with IBS, sharp stomach pains, (laughs) redness in the whites of the eyes, and the inability to stop making offensive, sour comments, I just want you all to know, I'm not possessed. Well, do we know that for sure? I guess not. We got to get those demons out of you. I mean, I'm also the same pretty much yeah. daily. This yeah. is, I got this going on. I don't think I emit a strong sulfur odor. I try but, to maintain a smell profile. Yeah. A, a nice <laughs> smell profile. I got extreme sensitivity to a lot of stuff, though. I will say that. I don't have great physical strength, though. <laughs> no, I'm lacking there. But it would be cool if all of a sudden I could just like yeet a couch across the room. Damn. Right. At what cost? <laughs> true. Yeah, true. <laughs> A mort told home of the mother magazine. I always ask that a medical diagnosis be done before the person comes to me. Normally, when a person feels these disturbances and problems, the first thing he does is go to the doctor and psychiatrist. It's very difficult to distinguish the devil's actions from a psychological problem. The path normally followed is to go to the psychiatrist, but not achieve any result. A mort found it essential to carefully evaluate each case and work with medical and psychological professionals to first rule out any explicable causes before proceeding with an exorcism. 
Once it was determined an exorcism was to be performed, Amort would begin the process. He would start the exorcism by playfully thumbing his nose at the devil. He followed Vatican-approved methodologies for his exorcisms, but would add in his own touches, like wearing a purple stole or a medal of St. Benedict, the saint famous for thrice defeating Lucifer. And that's what's on my bracelet is a St. Benedict medal. There you go. It says Vade Retro Satana. What does that mean? It means get back, devil. Step away, devil. Damn. In the uh, documentary of the filmed exorcism, he does, it's like if a kid was saying nanny, nanny, boo, boo. He kind of puts his thumb on his nose and, you know, uh, wiggles the rest of his fingers upwards like, I dare you. And he has this kind of, which is interesting because I think we've, everybody else has seen exorcisms through the lens of a horror film. And when you see him doing it, he he has, I won't say like a jovial affectation, but he's like, he's ready. It's like, it's like, it's every day. I mean, he's done thousands and thousands of them. And when that part comes, he's like in the middle of a, a prayer. And of course it's all in Italian, but he's in the middle and it goes from Italian then to Latin, but he's like praying, praying. And then he just goes, Ooh, and he kind of smiles when he does it. Like mm-hmm. this is part of it. And I wonder if that fed into his notion of this is how you properly perform it as being like joyous in God. And that's how you defeat the evil of Satan. Like maybe they go hand in hand because you could watch that and go, well, he's kind of flipping about it, but mm-hmm. it almost, it doesn't, it didn't come to me as a way like, Oh, ho, ho, I'm doing this nose thing. It's like, this is all part of it is to maintain this persona. I, yeah kind of like a flex like i'm yeah i'm better than you you're not gonna defeat me like you're you're lesser than me it perhaps might also put others in the room at ease because a lot of people in there for this that was of- another shock i said did everyone in her family come out for this and it looks like it and one of the um i think he was a neurosurgeon or perhaps a psychiatrist interviewed in the film you know, they speak about everyone in the community when, you know, you are a devout Catholic like this and this is what you believe. You all believe this is the process of how these things go. So it's not unusual or weird to do this because I was watching this, looking at it going, these people are unflinching. Everyone yeah. is just sitting there praying, you know, and kind of looking on calm. No one was losing their mind or crying or people are trying to hold Christina back. Also, it's her ninth exorcism, so they probably have seen it quite a bit. If everyone in the community is of the same mindset of this is how we do this, then it's not bizarre to them to seek out an exorcism for a problem like this. Yeah. And and they seem to know what to do. Of Like we sit over here, we have our rosaries, we pray. This is all part of it. It was a fascinating snapshot into another culture that I don't yeah, live every day. For sure. I agree. Sinisterhood will be right back. I got the the my Athena razor out the other day because it's been, you know, warming up around here. And I had my leg just across the couch and Paris put his hand on my shin and he was like, Your skin is so soft. And I was mm. like, Well, okay, you don't have to say it like that. Like <laughs> all winter I was just letting it grow out, but <laughs> I personally like it. My skin gets irritated if I have little pricklies on it. It gets hung on my tights, which I wear all the time. It's like yoga pants. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like a comfort in my pants and without my pants. Well, you always want to be comfortable, pants or no pants. And the way to start that is with the magic of the Athena Club razor blades. They're surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid. So you get a silky smooth shave that actually leaves skin soft and hydrated, not stripped dry. And the blades are spaced out to let hair and shave cream pass through easily. So you don't have to take a ton of passes over your skin to remove hair. Fewer passes means less irritation to your skin, cuts down razor burn and on ingrown hairs. The razor kit, it's only $9 with free shipping. And it comes with two blade cartridges. Our favorite, the magnetic mm-hmm. hook for the shower storage, and your choice of a handle color. And these aren't just junky disposable razors. These are nice. They they, they got a good hand feel in them. Yes. They're substantial. Yes. Yeah. I have. I got rose gold. And then mm-hmm. now I also have navy. So I had know, midnight no blue or navy. And then I got lavender. Ooh, see? And then if you also just want black or white. Where have you ever seen just like a nice, sleek black razor? 
It's just slick. I like it. It's mm-hmm. slick and it makes you slick. And you never have to worry about dull blades because you'll get refills sent to you on your schedule. Just choose how often you need fresh blades and Athena Club will send them automatically with free shipping. So you always have the best blades for the best shave. You also have got to get the Cloud Shave Foam. It's insanely thick. It stays on while you shave. It's not falling off. It's not just all over the shower floor before you can even use it. It's fantastic. It leaves your skin nourished and moisturized. I sincerely love it. It's how foam should work on your leg. Show your skin you care with the Athena Club Razor Kit. Head to athenaclub.com and use code CREEPY for 25% off your first order. Again, that's athenaclub.com and use code CREEPY for 25% off. Athena Club also launched in Target stores nationwide this month. So make sure to check out the shaving aisle to buy their products in store in real life. During the rituals, Amort would address the demon directly. He wrote in his book, The demons are very wary of talking. They must be forced to speak and do so only in the most severe of cases, those of true and complete possession. After determining who he was up against, Amort would cast out the demon, commanding in Latin for the creature to depart in the name of Jesus Christ. Amort says that the devil hated hearing Latin and would often prefer to speak in English. Well, now we know the devil speaks English. (laughs) Doesn't like Latin. I also didn't like Latin, didn't want to take it, uh, (laughs) and took Spanish instead. Me too. Me too. Except for my one semester of Italian, which I like to still pretend I'm like, I understand it. I don't. (laughs) I do not. It was one semester so long ago. But I looked up why. I was like, well, why does the demon not want to talk? I would think they're trying to flex. But Mm -hmm. from his perspective was that because he was there to do what he was going to do, which is defeat them, they didn't want to talk because they were basically trying to hide. They were trying to say, like, we're not in here. Leave us alone. You know, like when a salesman comes and rings the doorbell and you just don't move. Yeah. Because you're like, I don't like open the door and say stuff and look around and you can't yell at the dogs because then they definitely hear you're in there. So I just, you just freeze and wait. Mm -hmm. And then if the priest leaves then the devils can talk again. So that's what I saw it as a little bit is that he was trying to coax them, coax them. And he really has to kind of, and I wonder if the thumbing of the nose and the poking at them is to get them to show themselves so he can proceed accordingly. Kind of like Zach Bagans. Yeah. Flexing on the ghost. You want to intimidate these demons to come out. Damn. I Maybe that's a thing. I guess so. I would also say that um, door-to-door salesmen are like Satan himself. So <laughs> they should be treated the same. <laughs> I don't don't like be the coming that- and ringing my bell <gasps> at 8 o'clock at night trying to sell me something. I have kids. The double ring? Come on now. I told that you That happened other day. to you the other day. Thing, I said two times, and then I don't like it. I get it if it's you need to sell it. It's your job, whatever. Just be polite. This person li- then lied about who they were with. I got so mad. I was like, you double ring my bell. I told Paris, get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> Which, in retrospect, was not nice, but also... Well. Don't That's how Father and Mort talks to the demons, too. Get right, rid of all them. All he has to do, double ring that person's bell, and the demons will be like, the fuck? Mm-hmm. Don't ring it twice. <laughs> Things could get scary during the procedures. And Mort told ABC News, Some have vomited metal the size of a human finger. Others have vomited rose petals. According to the National Post, Amort claimed, The devil told a woman that he would make her spit out a transistor radio, and lo and behold... She started spitting out bits and pieces of a radio. Such things are rare, but they happen. Over the course of the hundreds of thousands of exorcisms he claimed to have performed, Amort kept a collection of things people had puked up, including nails, keys, chains, and plastic figurines. The sounds of the exorcisms irked his fellow priest, forcing Amort to move his office 23 times over the years, after complaints of slamming doors, screams, and vomiting coming from behind his door. Yeah, not a good neighbor. (laughs) He originally performed these at his office at the top of the Holy Stairs, which is a famed um, staircase, which, judging by the documentary, you have to uh, ascend on your knees. They said Martin Luther King Jr., also made the um, the climb up and, and heard a revelation from God during it. And again, like you said, to see this other culture and really feel like you're getting a firsthand account of, you know, just kind of someone's day to day of living that type of really holy life was it's very interesting to see um, how 
different all of us live our lives. Right. And how they, yeah, because the stairs are the, the tradition around the stairs is it's the stairs to the Praetorium of Pontius Pilate that Christ yes. walked up these stairs. And so it's become this holy, sacred place, which I think if you're trying to cast out the actual devil, great place to do it. However, if people, extremely important religious figures or justice icons, you know, if Martin Luther King Jr., they're wanting to ascend the stairs and there's somebody's barfing a radio next door <laughs> loudly, it can, it just wrecks the vibe a little bit. A little and bit. you you just want to move down the street a little bit, but you're right. I think it was uh, very interesting to watch a, the documentary. The, well, and it wasn't even just a documentary, his whole life. Amort was this open door of, I'll tell you about my good and bad about my religion. Cause we'll see later. He had some stuff to say about the Catholic church as a institution and some things, some ongoings with that. But like to see somebody be vulnerable with their faith and not, I mean, which uh, you could be subject to ridicule if someone's like, that's all, you know, you're so stupid. This is so dumb or whatever. But watching it firsthand, you see to the people that practice that faith, it's extremely real. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And and soothing. Yeah. They don't yeah. take it lightly. It's a very uh, comforting thing. I think they find a lot of um, comfort and guidance in it. And it, especially in those small towns over in Italy where you know, I mean, the streets are still cobblestone. Everything is, they showed the the walls, how they're made, nothing with mortar. It's just these stone pieces fit together perfectly like a jigsaw puzzle. And there's oil paintings on people's front doors and all throughout the, the town of religious figures. It's their whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's the at the forefront of, of how they live their lives. So when you have a whole community in town that, agrees on that there's something very comforting about living there and you feel i imagine protected and then when you think a demons come in to wreck shop everyone's like we're on we're on your side amort we're here to help like who are you gonna call father amort amort eventually got so good at performing an exorcism he could complete one in about half an hour sometimes doing five in his office before lunch at the end of a successful exorcism the result would sometimes be immediate. Others would have to return repeatedly for months or years before being cleared. In his book, The Devil is Afraid of Me, Amort explained exorcisms are not one-shot deals, but instead could last months or years, writing, I'm content if, in a mildly serious case, a person is liberated within four or five years of exorcisms. I've had rare cases of liberations in a few months. This was something else I didn't know. I always was kind of under the belief that it was a one and done thing. Yeah, and then you get it out. But it looks like they, they come back for at regular intervals and check in with them and check in. And he still checks in with them. And in some cases, he mentioned seeing medical records. And I wonder, and we can get into it. And so what do we think? But if you understand your role as a, a trusted advisor for your your parishioners and you see someone who has an issue and you say, I'll work on you with the exorcism, but you also have to go to a doctor. Mm -hmm. Is that then a way for you to just get your parishioners to also go to a doctor? Maybe. Throughout his life, Amort claimed to have conducted up to 60,000 exorcisms, including some over the phone and in later years via Skype. He published his book and exorcist tells his story in 1999 and was seen as an authority on exorcisms. Amort called the 1973 film The Exorcist a substantially exact representation of his work, and often cited it as his favorite film. Though the priests in the film did not perform the ritual properly, and the special effects were over the top, according to Amort. Well, nothing's perfect. It's not a documentary. <laughs> well, you know, it's Hollywood. You gotta spice it up a bit. I will say that the real exorcism we saw performed and the Hollywood one, they are vastly different. No yeah. one's head was spinning around. She writhed about and stuff, but it didn't take on a different look or form. Yeah. She uh, didn't puke up any pee looking soup or anything of that nature. No, she avoided the soup before. He's like, a couple of things before you come <laughs> and see me. I need to see your medical records. Don't eat any soup of any kind, especially not a split pea soup. No, I think come on an empty stomach. Yeah, it's probably for the best because mm -hmm. you might barf up pieces of a transistor radio, it sounds like. Yeah, that's, you know, I mean, how do you explain anything? There's probably several 
explanations for that, maybe theories. But if you're really barfing up um, pieces of metal, however that got in your stomach is not good. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to know whether you swallowed it or whether it, uh, on its own accord, just appeared there. Either mm-hmm. way, there needs to be some intervention. Well, and if you are suffering from some kind of uh, mental crisis and believe something is possessing you and telling you to eat metal parts, that's extremely dangerous to yeah. you know be sucking down bolts and nuts and shit. Or you didn't, and all of a sudden they're just there. Also, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? It's got to come out one way. Well, that's a, a, I mean, it's true, of course, a lot of these things, and we'll get into that here when we start talking about psychology, but the idea of like eating metal objects and pieces, that Mutter Museum in Pennsylvania, there's entire drawers that you pull out and it's just items that have been retrieved from people's stomachs and it's uh, safety pins, nails, things, because there's the that type of a compulsion where you have mm-hmm. to eat things and chew on things and swallow them and pennies and all kinds of stuff. And to just see it all laid out like that. And for some, it would be like, this is all from one patient and understanding that that's, that's such a compulsion to swallow something sharp like that. Mm-hmm. In 2016, William Friedkin, director of the film The Exorcist, followed Amort during one of his exorcisms for a documentary called The Devil and Father Amort. At the time, half a million people in Italy were seeking exorcisms every year, according to the film. The subject of the filmed exorcism was a 36-year-old architect named Christina, who had undergone eight exorcisms before, all performed by Father Amort. And they kind of explain how they met because another woman was Mm -hmm. having demonic issues and Amort helped her and... Her brother was present and then kind of started helping him more, just spot people, I guess, and yeah, referring that was, people. That was a little odd that you can just kind of be there for your sister's exorcism and you're like, hey, it's you just want to do a ride along? You want to come help? And he wasn't a priest or anything. So then he kind of assisted and he saw Christina at church during mass and because of the behavior she was exhibiting, said... I think you're possessed. And then she started trying to get unpossessed. Yeah, she starts meeting with him. But yeah, you're right. I don't know that they they don't really have like a badge that you have to have. Yeah. Like, prove no. that you're one. Yeah. For 17 minutes in the middle of the film, Amort performed Christina's ninth exorcism. The beloved priest allowed Friedkin to film the ritual as long as he did so alone on a small handheld camera. Also present in the room were fellow priests to assist Amort, Christina's boyfriend Davida, and over a dozen members of her family who held rosary beads and prayed throughout the process. And, you know, it's his office isn't huge, but it's enough for about, you know, 12 people to line up along one wall and then along the other wall, you know, uh, per- perpendicular to that, some windows, and then perpendicular across from her family is the chair, his desk, and that's where she's sitting. And then I guess that's Davida, and then another man is over her, and then Father Mort sits next to her. Mm -hmm. Everyone's just kind of gathered around waiting. And he has his briefcase of tools that includes some old crucifixes he's used throughout. He has pictures of other popes in the room, Uh, holy water. He has his bag of tricks. I thought it was interesting because the current pope is Francis, Before that, I think it was Benedict. And before that, it was John Paul II, which my Catholic friend used to call J.P. Dose. He was like, (laughs) we love J.P. Dose, J.P. Dose. But it's interesting because Amort said, oh, the devil really hates Pope John Paul II. Mm -hmm. He really specifically hates him. So I love to have his picture all over the place. And I just thought that was, who knows why? You know, we all have our enemies, don't we? (laughs) But as Pope John Paul II, I'd be like, hell yeah, I'm the one. (laughs) It's like, I'm the OG. It's the devil running. That gets the devil going. When I was in high school, I thought it was so trendy because I had a coin purse that was gold lame on one side. And on the other side was a holographic image of Pope John Paul II. And I would like <laughs> carry that to school as my like wallet. <laughs> I thought it was so trendy. Why did I think that was trendy? I guess because I was going to Catholic church with my friend. Were you carrying it ironically or because you thought it was you wanted a religious item next to you at all times it was ironically it was more ironic you thought it was cool oh yeah i did a lot of cringy shit i thought was cool when i was a teenager but that's (laughs) what being a teenager is yeah well who hasn't 
to this day, I do cringy shit that I think is cool, but I think it's cool now. And only with the benefit of time will I understand how cringe I am. <laughs> Sinisterhood will be right back. Well, y'all know we love our dogs. Kate, Buffy, and the Goose are all treasured parts of our family. And if you're like us, you want to give your furry little best friends the type of food and treats that they love, but also that you feel good about feeding them. And that's where Sundays for Dogs fits in. Sundays is healthy dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients. It's air-dried, and it's actually super easy to store and serve. Developed by practicing veterinarians, Sunday contains 90% meat, 10% vegetables, and 0% synthetic nutrients. This is how I also like to eat. It also contains USDA beef and all-natural chicken, plus digestive aids like pumpkin and ginger, and disease-fighting antioxidants, making Sundays the best way to feed your best friend. Well, and you got to have the natural food, otherwise they've Buffy can clear a room oh, with that gas. Man. I'll tell you what. Cakes. They, woo, they're oh, lethal. It's lethal. But they, especially the treats too, they love them. And when they see the box come out, the tails start wagging. And that's how you know. The, the dogs, they won't lie to you. No. They no. would just turn their nose up at it. Yeah. They don't lie. Unlike other fresh dog foods, Sunday's is zero prep, zero mess, and zero stress. It's also shelf stable, which makes it easy to feed your pup top quality food. Plus, every Sunday's order ships right to your door so you never worry about running out of dog food again. We worked out a special deal for our dog loving listeners. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash sinisterhood or use code sinisterhood at checkout. That's S U N D A Y S. F O R D O G S dot com forward slash sinisterhood. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. Ruff. Sitting in a chair next to Father Amort, his purple stole draped around both his neck and Christina's. Amort recited prayers and passages in Italian and Latin while laying hands on Christina, who rocked back and forth with her eyes closed, appearing to be in a trance like state. As the exorcism ramped up, Christina's body began to violently writhe while animalistic screams erupted from her. While family members held her down, Father Amort continued to pray over Christina, demanding the evil presence leave her body. I wanted to ask your opinion on this. What do you think about her voice in this part? So her voice, while she's being exercised, clearly doesn't sound like her. It's, you know, this... Um, very distorted, loud, like you would hear in a film if someone was doing a demonic voice, you know. Guttural. She's shouting in Italian, so I'm not sure what she's saying. It certainly does not sound like her voice. I Are you asking what I think was causing it? Well, just what did you think about the sound of it? And is it her throwing her voice or freaking maybe altering the audio. I was thinking, well, you could, you could alter this audio, but there were several times where he was speaking and she was screaming over him. And given that Friedkin was only shooting it on a single handheld camera with a single mic, you would just have one single audio track. So I was like, you couldn't pull her audio, distort it while leaving his undistorted. No, so I never thought that me. he, he messed with it or anything. I think yeah. that is what the sound was. that was coming out of her mouth how or why who knows but uh i do think that that was what was happening and it is a scary sound and she's trying to break free from the people holding her down and writhing around and stuff and everyone is kind of just you know like well this is fine if i had been there i think i would have been a little freaked out maybe left the room been a little more like ah what's happening but again that wasn't how i was raised in what I necessarily believe in. So I think as an outsider, it's going to appear more, it's going to, it's going to appear different to me than it would to people that this is what they believe. Right. And I was thinking that too, because they talked with her before and after, and at no time does she seem to be psychotic, delusional. I mean, she's has a day job. She's functional. She she's able to consent to what's about to happen. I mean, she wants it to happen. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking that because I know there's cases and and he commented on I think the the case out of Germany that eventually was like the exorcism of Emily Rose where they I mean they tortured that young lady. Yeah. And he said that is not how it's done. That was she was abused. That's torture. It should not be a, 
that's not how it should be basically because i was what you said it was more demure than what i would expect to see like yeah. you would expect somebody like laying down and but she was kind of just sitting in the chair and if, i mean she would get up on him because i think they weren't like they weren't holding her the whole time. Like if she started to move, they would kind of like sit her back down. But I, I was surprised at the duration. That was quite a short duration. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was a little sweaty or something, but nobody was like, it wasn't traumatic. It didn't look horrifying. It seemed like it was exactly what she expected it to be and what everybody expected it to be. I was also um, surprised at how the whole thing began because it wasn't as if she was currently in a possessed state and he came into the room to to help she and all of her family went to his office she's it's like any appointment mm -hmm. and she's talking it's she's totally like herself and stuff and then you know sits in the chair it's almost i would equate it almost more to like being going under hypnosis yeah where you're like in your regular mindset and then she sat in the chair and as he began to pray and stuff that's when her eyes closed and she started to rock back and forth and would you know start yelling and stuff but at the end it wasn't as if there was like this big it was kind of anticlimactic like how it ended it wasn't like and now the demons are cast from you and you know we saw this huge like change in her and she everyone cheered it was just like okay, this is over now. Like, I was like, oh, it's over? And then she was just, like, awake again and talking and, like, laughing. It was it was strange. Yeah, you're. that's a good point because he did say, and I wonder, too, if that's part of his practice or whatever, because he goes, okay, that's enough for the day. Because she was, of course, growling and writhing and stuff. And eventually he's like, okay, that's enough. Like, basically, let's finish this out with this prayer and then it's over with. And he's like, are you all right? You need a glass of water? Like, mm -hmm. everything okay? But you're. it's, it's like he didn't want to, like, get her too tormented or tortured i don't know yeah and in that case too it's almost like hypnosis where you're like in control of what's going on and you're like okay now i'm gonna pull the person back into an awake alert state and, and mm -hmm. we're gonna end this and i didn't know that that's how they worked i did not either i thought the devil was in control yeah. and he said when things were over and when they start yeah, it's, I mean, according to him, they're chilling down in there and then they make their appearance however often and the more frequent it is, if it starts to interfere with your life, I suppose that's when you go mm -hmm. and call him. After nearly 20 minutes, Christina returned to her normal self, smiling and laughing with those around her. The celebration, however, was short-lived. As Father Amort blessed Christina's father and mother, she once again began writhing and speaking in a demonic voice seemingly much more violent than when the exorcism first began. Unfortunately, this meant Christina had not been ridded of her demons. Two months after the filmed exorcism, Friedkin attempted to interview Christina at a church 200 miles southeast of Rome. Friedkin said that when he and his producer entered the cathedral, it was freezing cold, despite being over 100 degrees outside. Christina appeared to be possessed once again. She screamed and growled as she slithered around on the floor, pulling her boyfriend Davida along with her. Friedkin described the harrowing scene in his documentary. We were trapped in a living nightmare. As Davida tried to hold his girlfriend back, he demanded the return of the footage, yelling at Friedkin to, Give us back your film! Christina appeared to have other ideas, growling in a demonic voice, No, I want it shown! Staring down Friedkin, Davida threatened the director if he didn't comply. If you don't give it back to us, we'll kill you. We'll find your family and we'll kill you all. Terrified, Friedkin and his producer left the cathedral and headed back to Rome. He did not hand over his footage, and at the end of the documentary, he states Christina was still suffering from her affliction and seeking help from local priests. Well, that's an interview that went awry, to say the least. Yeah. When he first set it up, you know, he's like, we were going to meet in this place and then we met somewhere else. But then she told me that she was at the cathedral and I thought she was going to like she didn't want to do a follow up and she was going to pull a switcheroo and maybe she was going to be in Rome and she had gotten him to go like hundreds of miles outside of it to be like, oh, whoops, we're all in the wrong place. Guess you have to go back to America and you can't interview me. This is much different and much worse. <laughs> it was not what I imagined at all. Yeah. He said that when they left, he and the producer didn't speak for a half hour. 
They just drove back to Rome, just trying to grapple with what he said. He said it was the scariest thing he's ever witnessed. I imagine if you're in an old cathedral and it's just the four of you and two of you are threatening your life and one of them is slithering around on the floor like a demon with plastic chairs and shit. That's not something that I want to do. He did not take his camera in. So he says in the documentary, this is all from memory. I imagine that that sticks with you. So I'm going to trust his memory. Yeah, I think it gets burned in your mind whenever you think you're going for a fun follow-up interview and someone is screaming, we'll find you and kill your family, we'll kill you all. I think that turns uh, rather uh, sour your afternoon that you thought it was going to be a nice afternoon in the Italian countryside. What do you think was going on with Davida? I wonder if my thinking is twofold. Either it was maybe not a real case of possession, as we say. Father Amort gave a percentage of like 0.1% of all of them being actual cases. And maybe it's, oh, I have a career as an architect and I've just been filmed getting an exorcism and I don't want that out there. However, at the time, and it seems to have grown, a half a million people a year are seeking out exorcism. So it doesn't sound like it's something that's like super rare and shameful. So in which case, I wonder if Davida had heard from, you know, if the demon growls and is like, as soon as everyone sees this, then I'll be more powerful. And he's like, oh shit, people can't see this. It's going to make it worse. Or if people see this, I'll be able to finally take over and kill Christina for once and for all. You know, he might have this fear of, oh shit, I've heard from the demon voice that if it gets out, it's going to be that much worse. You know, and you, that's why you say, because in my head, I'm like, why would you threaten some uh, some guy that you otherwise have no beef with, like threaten to literally kill him? Mm-hmm. I would think the stakes would have to be so high that you think it's life or death. Yeah. You think? Maybe more of a shared delusion or um, he's having his own type of possession and demons within. And he, you know, I mean, what is it? Foyla do? Probably you kinda, him, yeah. yeah, you kind of have the same experiences. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it was financially motivated because he never asked uh, for money. You know, like, if well, we'll leave you alone. If you, if you don't want to give us the footage, then give us a bunch of money or whatever. I mean, they kind of parted ways and didn't speak after that. Yeah, you just run out with your line producer and just get in the car and speed off back to Rome. Yeah. Friedkin showed his footage of Christina's exorcism to a panel of psychiatrists, as well as two of the world's top neurosurgeons. He told Vanity Fair, I went to these doctors to try to get a rational, scientific explanation for what I had experienced. I thought they'd say, this is some sort of psychosomatic disorder having nothing to do with possession. That's not what I came away with. 45 years after I directed The Exorcist, there's more acceptance of the possibility of possession than there was when I made the film. The crew of psychiatrists from Columbia University interviewed on camera said the reality of the possession was not relevant. The ritualistic cleansing of evil served to help treat the underlying condition. One of the doctors even said he was dealing with a current case of possession at the time of filming and wouldn't indicate to the patient whether he believed the spirits were real or not, saying, We don't take a position during this treatment. Because there are possession myths in Christianity, Judaism, and many other worldwide religions and cultures, the doctors recognize and respect the cultural variations in their patients and treat them accordingly. I thought this was very interesting, and I always like a roundtable discussion of experts yeah. who have just seen something for the first time, and you're kind of seeing in, in real time, like them processing it. And, you know, the doctor that said... We've seen this patient many times. She comes in. She has delusions that she's being possessed by a demon and hallucinations. We treat her with medication. She gets better. And then, you know, a couple months later, the the cycle repeats itself. While she's here, though, we don't tell her that she's wrong or right. We just treat the symptoms to help her get better. Yeah. And that's what I reached out to my friend who's a a therapist because I thought, you know, I've read, we, you know, through the research of this, listening to these doctors, tons of interviews with other doctors. And there's a niche area of psychology research about how to balance 
the cultural competency with treating del- patients who have religious delusions, which I can't, I mean, because I'm not an expert in the field, I never even would have thought of that, that that would be, of course, that would be an issue when you're trying to treat a patient because you want to treat the patient as a whole. And a friend of mine who's, like I said, who's the therapist said, shutting someone down entirely is not helpful in terms of any therapeutic intervention if the idea is that you want them to talk to you. So if they come in and say, I'm possessed by a demon and you go, nah, demons aren't real and n- neither is God and none of this is real. They're not going to talk to you. They're not going to now. Do you want to say, oh, my God, you are possessed by a demon. And my friend who's a therapist said, no, we wouldn't want to do that. You want to it's like you would treat somebody with a persecutory delusion that thinks the CIA is following them. Yeah. You don't go, no, the CIA is not following you. Are you stupid? Why you would do you just think like, that? What's going on? Exactly. Tell yeah. me your feelings about this. So I thought that was really fascinating The and I texted and said, you know, is it like a rock in a hard place? And she said, yeah, that's exactly what it is because you want to be thoughtful and holistic about a person, but you also aren't going to be like, yes, let's bring your priest into this next session, you know, because it's what I'm treating is the mental health aspect. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to treat. And we need to treat it from, I'm not going to take a stand one way or the other of yes, demons are real or no, they're not. The reality is you are sitting here asking me for help. Let's talk about how things are not going well in your life, how you're hurting yourself, how you're hurting others, whatever. That's what we're going to deal with. And I was like, that's fascinating because it is hard to, you know, you don't want to just shut somebody down entirely because they're not going to ask you for help. Well, that also makes you a biased medical professional. I, I think it's the same in any kind of medicine. If your religion or your culture says we don't do certain kinds of medications, we don't go to the doctor for certain things, and then somebody needs medical care, but they're also kind of against it, having to toe that line of how do we remain respectful, but also doing our job that we have taken an oath to perform ethically, Mm -hmm. which is help someone in the medical crisis, mental health crisis, whatever they're having. So it is a rock and a hard place. And um, kudos to those that that can, can, can do it while being respectful and, um, compassionate at the same time yeah it's i was like god bless you because that's a a whole career god bless all the therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists out there because it's i was like what do you do when someone believes they're god and she's like i've had a patient that's like that and you deal with it moment by moment with them and yeah because you don't want to just throw everybody in a guardianship who has some sort of you know because somebody might say christy i was driving the other day and i thought do i turn left or right And I just felt like God told me to turn right. And so I turned right. And isn't that a delusion that I think God was talking to me? Well, what's the difference in me going, my gut really told me to turn right and let like we all live these momentary small delusions. And so I think wholesale saying, oh, your belief system is fucking dumb. You can't say that. It's what they believe because what you believe to them or other people might be fucking dumb. Right. It's it's that harm. I think the the introduction of the element of harm is when there needs to be any type of intervention. Absolutely, yes. Others in the medical community believe it can be damaging to acknowledge a patient's self-reported demonic possession. Stephen Novella, a neurologist and professor at Yale School of Medicine and founder of the New England Skeptical Society, told CNN, The worst thing you can do to a patient who is delusional is to confirm their delusions. The primary goal of therapy is to reorient them to reality. Telling a patient who's struggling that maybe they're possessed by a demon is the worst thing you can do. It's only distracting them from addressing what the real problem is. And that's what I asked about. I said, you know, what do you even say? And when when they say, well, I think I'm going to go see an exorcist or I'm going to go to see a, you know, a a priest or whatever. She was like, well, you know, you want to respect somebody's relationship with the clergy, you know, with their religion, whatever that is, and say, you know, get spiritual guidance. But again, I'm not going to confirm and say, yes, you're, you know, possessed by the devil or yes, you're God or whatever. And I think that's the line, it's a hard line to toe between confirming a delusion and saying, let's just operate under the assumption that we can't know if it's real or not. How are we going to treat you going forward? But it's definitely, that's why there's all this literature. And it's not just devil, Satan, you know, Christian religion. When reading these case studies, it's religions where they think, okay, if we do this certain prayer, rain will come. But one of the issues is that one of the people that does the prayer is going to get Uh, an evil entity attached to them. And then we all have to circle around them and do this other thing that will then make the evil entity go out of them. But if we do that, there's rain. I mean, you can't come in. That's colonization, right? When you go in and go, that belief is nonsense. Nuh-uh. She has a delusion. You know, you, so psychologists in the field are like, we have to work with, how do we work with that and understand, yeah, that's your culture, 
but we want to also make sure you're safe and not, you know, not eating for however long or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sticky situation to tell a person that they thinks they're possessed by a demon. Yeah, you really are. I can understand how that would be harmful because yeah. your worst fear is confirmed. You have a medical professional being like, yeah, you got a demon inside you. Try not to eat any radio parts. That's, yeah. you know, I don't think that that's helpful, but listening and being a, a kind and sympathetic ear while also not making them feel stupid or like they're wrong is the way you got to handle it along with perhaps medicine and uh, therapy and other things. And that's what you're exactly right. It's the same as saying, yes, the CIA really is following you. And mm -hmm. uh, my friend just said, you know, you say, let's get you to safely navigate the world that you live in and try to live and act outside of your delusions and find a pathway to an average day for you, not a day where you're always getting attacked by demons every right. day. So it's a, a hard line to toe. Yeah. I mean, I've there's a girl I follow on TikTok that – she has schizophrenia, as does her husband, and she kind of documents in a kind of playful, light way, but also to show, like, this is how difficult it is when two people in a relationship are diagnosed with schizophrenia. But she talks about it in a way which is, you know, like, look how crazy our life is. This is what happened today. But a lot of it is she has auditory hallucinations and he has visual and he will think that or maybe it's the other way but she said you know i'll open the door to go to work and i think that there's a demon standing there blocking my way to the car and i have to tell myself this isn't real you know i can get in the car so the doctor isn't saying yeah there is a demon there be prepared to fight because that's horrifying you have you know but saying this is your reality, which means your body really does think that this is what you're experiencing and all of the symptoms are real. Yeah. Know though that you're safe and you can get safely in the car and proceed with your day, you know, yada, yada, yada. So you don't live in a life where you're just trapped in your house all the time. No, that's a good point. And she, my friend made that point that you – can't tell someone that their experience isn't real because to them it is very real. Just like if you are having a depression episode or having an anxiety episode, you're having a panic attack. Well, your heart rate's not really that high. It's not real. You just need to calm down. It's like, no, some things physiologically feel very real to you. And that's a, a reality, but you can't live in that and maintain and stay in that. You find ways to, like she said, operate outside of that and cope with it. She also mm -hmm. wanted me to make sure to say people with severe mental illness are more likely to be victims of violent crime than to perpetrate violent crime. They're more likely to be harmed. Cause I think a lot of times speaking about people with delusions or illnesses, the stigmatization has come about. And as a person who works with those with delusion disorder, uh, she wanted me to pass that message along and I appreciate it. Yeah. That's studies have shown that that is very true. Sinisterhood. will be right back. Though the faithful may believe these incidents are caused by the devil, psychologists have developed a term for cases like those seen by a mort, dissociative trance disorder. Recognized in the World Health Organization classification ICD-11, DTD is a condition in which a person experiences a dissociative state during which they feel possessed by a spirit or another entity. The DSM-5 classifies demonic possession as a subdiagnosis of dissociative identity disorder. And the psychiatrists from Columbia talk about this in the Friedkin documentary as well of like yes. figuring out how to diagnose that and different terminologies that are used in different checks, you know, check it off the list of they have these symptoms or they don't. Treatment for DTD includes psychotherapy and medication. However, because these instances involve deeply held religious and cultural beliefs, psychologists have called for a culturally relativist understanding of factors that might influence presentation and help seeking. Which I also thought was interesting because they were saying that in religions or in, in cultures where, you know, you're deeply religious, if you do have access to medical care and the medical care you get is denying your religion, denying your culture, then you might somebody who might have a severe, significant mental illness and not seek out help because they think, oh, I'm just going to be they're going to tell me I'm crazy and none of this is real. And so it negatively impacts help seeking in situations. Mm hmm. A study in the Kathmandu University Medical Journal explained how the same symptoms are labeled differently depending on culture. 
from multiple personality disorder in the West to voodoo possession in Africa and trance and possession disorder in Italian subcontinent. In cases where there are cultural influences at play, the addition of a religious or spiritual leader to the treatment plan has proven effective. The journal article states, Exorcism has been seen by doctors as well to bring profound mental and physical improvement leading to total remission. Which, there, it's just certain psychiatrists say, don't do that. Other ones say it helps in some cases. So, I mean, it's that's why we have doctors, right? It's a case-by-case basis. But I'm glad that there's more and more research about this so you don't have people who are just suffering silently. Yeah, I think it's, like you said, a case-by-case. And also, different doctors believe different things. So, if you go to a doctor in a small town in Italy where it's an extremely religious community, they might you know, treat things differently than if you come to the West and you go to a a doctor here. And you see that there are, when you're looking for a therapist, it'll be like Christian counseling or Jewish counseling, where it's like somebody that also is going to understand how religion plays into your mental health journey. Mm -hmm. So, Father Amort passed away on September 16th, 2016, at the age of 91 from complications of pneumonia. Thousands of people from all over Italy attended his funeral. At the time of his death, Amort had performed more exorcisms than anyone else in the Catholic Church, with the number reaching over 60,000. Of the thousands he performed, however, Amort told Friedkin only about 100 were genuine cases of true demonic possession. He published over 30 books before his death, leaving behind a legacy of written words for those who came after him. The organization for exorcists he started in the 1990s endures to this day. Friedkin's documentary received generally negative reviews from both critics and audiences. NPR's review said that despite Friedkin's experience as a director, the film seems to have been made by someone who's never seen a movie before. Entertainment Weekly, meanwhile, criticized the film's chilling air of taboo voyeurism. It's not a great movie. Listen, it's not a great documentary. It's not great. I mean, it's like you said, it's like watching uh you know the commentary of a film yeah it would be a dvd extra on the yeah, exorcist yeah, yeah. like 40th anniversary edition it's an hour and 10 minutes long and it's just william freakin with a handheld camera most of the time paris walked in and he goes who made this and i go william freakin and he goes by himself and i was like yeah i think <laughs> he so. had and to he goes, there it is <laughs> yeah i mean he had to film the exorcist and that was part of the thing is mort said you can film it because it no one had never been filmed before, mm-hmm. and he had to, you know, run it up the flagpole of who of the other members of the diocese and whatnot. And he said, "Okay, you can film it, but only on a small handheld camera. You can't have any crew or any lights with you. No one would have fit anyways. The room was Mm-mm. packed to the brim. But you know, I mean, it, it can it does like make you feel like it's more of a." Um, first-hand account like you're a fly on the wall because it's not heavily produced or anything i will say for someone who has directed a a renowned film it was a bit green it's inter it's like he has a youtube channel and he was like hey guys i went to italy and i'm gonna show you my vlog but then 17 minutes in the middle is the first filmed exorcism (laughs) like yeah it's just bombs in the middle it was it was interesting. The score is <laughs> quite <Something> jarring. <laughs> yeah, the and uh, the some of the cuts, like he interviews two, one UCLA neurosurgeon and one neurosurgeon from Tel Aviv. Oh University. my god, the one that looks like he was just in a bar fight the night before. He's got these band aids all over his face, and not that that's. I mean, whatever he's been through, a cat attack, a bar fight, he <laughs> fell off a motorcycle face first. I don't know, but the. The shot, it cuts such an extreme tight close up on his face and he's just talking all of a sudden. And you're like, you've never seen him before. Yeah. It's the first introduction of him in the whole movie. And I was like, holy shit, who is this man and what happened to him? <laughs> yeah, but- there wasn't any comment on uh, Dr. Such and Such who was recently in an accident. And <laughs> like, maybe no. just explain because the, the bandages were so much so that it was distracting a bit and you were just i found myself wondering what happened here instead of paying attention to what he was actually saying yeah he could have said easily dr so-and-so who recently was in a car accident but yes. still agreed to speak to us we'd be like oh okay but it's, it's like why are there tables 
Her job yeah. is tables. I'm like, what are what does she do with the tables? I was like, what's the band aids though? Stop asking about the band aids. It's about the exorcism. I'm like, but I'm but I'm thinking about those band aids yeah. though. I hope stop. he's okay. I hope he healed up. He had a lot of very good, poignant remarks. Yeah. So uh, he, you know, I Friedkin tried with almost every person he interviewed to get them to say concretely. Yes, I believe in the devil. Yes, I think exorcisms are possible. You know, and and no one, no, from psychologists to neurosurgeons to bishops, would definitively say yes or no. They all said, you know, I I know enough to know that I don't know everything, and yeah. I'm you know, and I think that is the mark of someone who's truly successful and enlightened in what they do that they're not like i'm a neurosurgeon i went to yale are you crazy there's no such thing as demonic possessions it's like you know i can't tell you why they're here but i can tell you that these symptoms are not typical and they're unhealthy and we're going to treat that right that's a good provider who's like well, we're going to take the evidence that we have in front of us that we can prove and mm -hmm. disprove and we're going to operate off of that and anything else is just in the periphery and that's not something that we need to focus on so that's that's probably why he liked interviewing them, but yeah. they would not. He wanted to play. They oh yeah, they wouldn't play ball. He was no. like, "Come on though, come on!" And they're like, "The guy goes, you're not here to talk about me." I was like, <laughs> uh. A film adaptation of a Mort's life will be released April fourteenth, twenty twenty three, called "The Pope's Exorcist," starring Russell Crowe as Father Amort. Not everyone, however, is thrilled with the film's release. The International Association of Exorcists condemned the movie claiming it distorts and falsifies what is truly lived and experienced during the exorcism of truly possessed people. Father Amort left behind over 30 books in multiple languages, an organization of priests following in his footsteps, a documentary, a movie adaptation of his life, and at least for some relief from the grips of Satan, whether real or imagined. While no official data is available, church leaders said in 2019 that there were more Catholic exorcists working in the United States today than at any other time in recent history. So what do we think? Well, it sounds like it's a good time to get in the exorcism game. There, I mean, 2019 to now, it hadn't been great. So, you know, it's been real tough all over the world for a lot of people which I think I would be remiss to say perhaps there isn't a connection between, you know, global turmoil and the connection here. No, that's true. <laughs> so what do you think about um, demonic possession? Well, it's interesting because as much as, you know, what do they say? Like you can say, oh, I don't believe it or I'm not Christian or whatever. But I mean, I still wear my St. Benedict medal. I still have my little St. Benedict figurine I keep with me. So it's interesting when, what do you, you know, what do you yell whenever somebody's running at you? Like, save me, Jesus. Mm. It's like, okay, well, is that what you really believe? So reading, I don't fuck with devil stuff. I don't, I'm not trying to conjure the devil. I'm not trying to, he, you know, he's doing his thing. If he is at all, I don't know. I guess that makes me agnostic, but for these people for, and what I thought it was interesting that Father Amort said was, you know, it's going to be a very devoutly religious person. Generally speaking, people who are not religious are, gonna, are not going to come see me for an exorcism. Right. So there is that part of it, too. But I think having read all the studies and especially the ones that broke down not just instances of Catholic people or Catholic people in Italy or whatever, but reading people of various, I mean, 30 different faiths. 30 different cultures having this similar instance. I think that the disassociative trance disorder is probably pretty likely cause for most of them. And even to his credit, father and Mort said, you know, of 60, 70,000 exorcisms I did a hundred were real. And the rest of them were maybe people that wanted a little, I mean, if you watch Christina's exorcism, there's nothing in that aside from her getting a little sweaty and growling and stuff that he's not abusing her. He's not grabbing her. The person holding her is her own family. It's, it's her boyfriend, you know, it's her own family. And so where you get into the danger of anything is people that are doing it incorrectly outside of the, you know, the bounds of the international association of exorcists or saying, don't go see a psychologist. Don't go see a doctor. You have to come see me. I'm the only answer. And I think that's when the harm when when there's the introduction of harm, I think that's when lines need to be drawn. But it seems like he was pushing people to get 
medical treatment, psychological care. And then he, I believe he said, uh, you know, a, an unnecessary exorcism never really hurt anybody. Was well, what that's he said. what I was going to comment on is it's interesting that he's performed 60,000 and admits a hundred of those were the real deal. So that's a huge amount that he is saying, I knew that this wasn't really the deal, but I continued with it multiple times in most cases with the same person. So the harm part of him saying, you know, no harm has come from one. I don't know if I a hundred percent agree with that because while perhaps he's speaking to like a placebo effect of, well, if this person, something is wrong with them and this makes them feel better then you know, if so facto, why not do it? However, back to the Yale University's neurosurgeon's quote of like, you don't want to tell people that their delusions are real because it just perpetuates this fiction that is unhealthy for them. And I wonder if, and so the whole thing in his book was that he was like, you can't really know if someone is truly possessed until you get in and do the exorcism. Yeah. So that's probably why is that he finishes and goes, they were faking or like, all right. Or come it back was something else. Me. They talk in um, the documentary. One, of, I believe the the banged up neurosurgeon shows a 3D image of the brain to Friedkin. And it, it's all color coded in like what's verbal, what controls, um, you know, language and whatnot. And then in the middle, there is this big lump. And he's like, and that is a frontal lobe tumor. One of the symptoms of it is having these thoughts and delusions that you were extremely religious and that these yeah. religious things are, are happening to you, which I think, like you said, if that's how you're raised and it's already like in your culture and just, you know, you're like, oh yeah, it's probably the devil I'm possessed. It doesn't occur to you like this would be something that I wouldn't consider, but someone who maybe isn't raised like that, that's not something that they think I'm not going to, if I start spewing stuff and my eyes turn red, I'm not going to assume I'm possessed by the devil. So I'm not going to go to a doctor or a priest seeking that out. I would assume something's going on like mentally or medically with me and, and go to a doctor. So I think a lot of it is cultural and that's where you got to toe the line of being respectful, but also still doing your job as a, a doctor to make sure that this person is, getting healthy. Oh, no, definitely. And especially if it's, uh, it could be like a tumor or something that needs yeah. medical intervention and you'll die. Because you hear cases of, oh, you know, this uh, this person was so possessed, she had this crazy strength. Well, people have strength when they think their kids got run over by a car or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we have these surges of strength. Or, oh, this person was possessed because they never, they're born, raised in Italy, and all of a sudden they're speaking English. And the there's cases where people have had brain injuries where they speak a language that they've never spoken mm -hmm. before. I don't, we can't explain it. Nobody, I don't know how to explain that. So, but I don't know that they're possessed by the devil. They're touched by something, maybe some type of energy out there. So I think what you're right though, and you're, you don't want to necessarily tell people, yeah, for sure. Let's go ahead and do this. I think for him, he was in the middle where he was like, have you been to a doctor? Have you been to a psychologist? Are you clear that you don't have a delusional disorder? You don't have this. And if it's almost like a, a mild form of the delusion and he's, you know, they're like, Oh, I'm cured after six months and they never recurred again. Then I think that's where his, well, there's really no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. You're right though. I think if you do get somebody in there that is, has a serious delusion that does need intervention does need. But the friend that I talked to was like, you know, because we all have these delusions that we call our belief system, at what point are you going to start locking people up that, and, and you see more harm comes from being in a guardianship or being, you know, under somebody's, thumb basically that you can't get out you know you're an inpatient or you're in a guardianship because you had uh something that could have otherwise been treated more gently and without this introduction of of like a priest or something like that so i think you can acknowledge their experience and their feelings without confirming yeah you're totally possessed but here's how i'm not a priest so what we're going to treat you with is what i'm equipped to treat you with and just understanding how very 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 lucky that we're in america and for his shitty as our medical system and our mental health system is that we have any access is w more than we can say for some countries. Of course, yeah. some are way better off and it's easier to get access to, but anywhere you just having, having the uh, access to that. And if you don't, it's going to be a religious leader, a shaman even, or, you know, a, a healer 
that's it, you can't necessarily go, well, this is a Yale trained neurosurgeon who can help me. So having doctors that are doing these studies on ways to assist people in areas that maybe they don't have that direct access to medical help, I think can can help people from harming each other, especially, you know, him saying like, you know, the exorcism of Emily Rose kind of shit. Don't do that. This last 30 minutes. Like this is not starve this person and lock her in a barn for six weeks. It is talk with her for half an hour. And if that doesn't work, let her go back to her doctor. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. So. I agree. Yeah. I think you shit. made a good point of it becomes, this isn't harmful. You know, this person's getting something out of it is when they, potentially self-harm or harming others and Mm -hmm. you know that kind of stuff gets gets introduced is where if you're on your 10th exorcism and that isn't working i think it's time to try a different approach yeah and make sure they're under the care of a medical professional who if they hear you know oh the devil is in my head and told me i'm gonna go kill blank that if you're in a mandate reported state that you say okay i'm gonna inform the police this person is an imminent threat to another or Mm -hmm. an imminent threat to themselves but i think it's uh it's definitely a rock and a hard place, but that's we we run into the same stuff in constitutional law, right? With we have freedom of religion in the United States, you know, Congress shall make no law. But what happens when cities make laws, you know, picking on a religion, saying you can't perform exorcisms anymore, mm-hmm. things like that? And we have to we have these balancing tests, and you know, sometimes it's fun to have like a, a you know lay the hammer down, like this is definitely this. But with stuff like faith and religion, a lot of it has to be I don't believe that, but if you do. I'm not one to tell you you're wrong because I can't prove that you're wrong. Yeah. Well, I think the answer lies in Russell Crowe's performance. And we will right. see in just a couple days now. Get at Satan. <laughs> Damon, <laughs> cast it out. I'm going to need a bigger knife for this exorcism. <laughs> That's not a crucifix. That's a crucifix. <laughs> He pulls it out. He's like crocodile. Oh, no. Baby. His first one is just exercising <laughs> a crocodile. Yeah. Man. I. I got him. He's a wily one. Uh, <laughs> the reviews of this movie, I, I will see it. I will just warn everybody, they haven't been great. <laughs> is it even going to the theaters? It is in the theater. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, apparently, it's just sort of, you know, it's your run-of-the-mill exorcism horror movie, although people said Crow's performance is particularly cheeky. I watched an oh. interview with him because Amor was cheeky, right? That's why yeah. I wanted to cover this too, because I was like, I want, if you were such a badass that you literally have a book about you called The Devil's Afraid of You, and you're like, Russell Crowe's going to play you in a movie, and then you see him, and he looks like an adorable little, <laughs> he's just a little grandpa. Uh, <laughs> grandpa I just Tortoise. Very, he does. He looks like a, maybe like a little Dr. Seuss, like sweet mm-hmm. character. But they said that in the movie, be, they, I think, try to kind of capture some of like a more where he, you know, he thumbs his nose at the mm-hmm. devil by having Russell Crowe have little like quips here and there, including a Easter egg of him in front of the Roman Coliseum because he played. Oh, yeah. The gladiator. Mm-hmm. The gladiator. And kind of like a wink, a little wink to the audience. OK, well, we'll have to see it and decide for ourselves. Mike and movies, making songs and fighting demons around the world. <laughs> That's my South Park reference for you for the day. Oh, thank you so much. Well, speaking of thank yous, thank you to everybody who's already come out and seen us on tour. And if you yes. haven't, you still got a lot more opportunities, quite honestly. We've just started this thing. You are right. We are, we've only just begun. And speaking of South Park, going to Denver first, then Salt Lake, Austin, and Houston. We told you all about those. Those are the ones just in the next three weeks. But in June, we're going to be in San Francisco on June 7th. We're going to be in Los Angeles on June 9th. Then in July, we're going to Boston on the 19th, Brooklyn on the 20th, Washington, D.C. on July 22nd. And then in August, we'll be in Detroit on the 15th and Columbus, Ohio on the 16th. And then Pittsburgh on August 17th. So if you want to go to any of those, head to SinisterHood.com slash live shows. If you have fun stuff to do in any of those cities, please email them to us because we had a great tip on the peculiarium oh, in yeah. Portland. That was super and we fun. have some, we got some tips for Denver and Salt Lake. So yes. Yeah. I have some Pittsburgh tips as well. Okay. People have Again. been sending in some Pittsburgh tips. 
They're rolling in. Well, we will be bringing you the Full Moon Energy Tour. It's an all-new show format. I know some people are like, what t- topic? Or is it going to be a local topic? It's local to all of us because it's the moon and it's yeah. there all the time. But we cover all types of stuff, cryptids, crimes, conspiracies, hoaxes, comedy. It's a fun, funny night. And then we have our VIP afterwards. It's 45 minutes just hanging out with us, doing talking about whatever we want. Probably hear about some of these TikTok conspiracies we're talking about. See, that's oh, so that's many. where you hear the stuff that we don't talk about on the show. It's like, no. okay, we talked about this on the on the stoop. Yes. It didn't make the air. Yes. But we'll tell y'all. Yes. That's what we... Now, Christy moved because we used to sit on her stoop. Now we sit in the backyard. So it's... Uh, but it was still In the backyard. The <laughs> Just like sitting on the grass in the backyard. We sit. We're sitting we on a, a porch in the backyard. We, take we a have a picnic out. in the backyard. We do have a little picnic table. But yeah, if you want to feel like you're part of the stoop chat in the VIP Q&A, make sure you get those tickets. If they're not sold out, they're sold out in most cities. But there's still a couple left in some locations. Go to sinisterhood.com slash live shows. You also get a free autographed poster. That's right. You do. With your VIP. Well, we hope to see you there. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the rolling the airwaves and getting into it tier, a special shout out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and more. And patrons in our getting into it tier will also vote on a bonus content segment that they would like to see us live streamed. And the bonus live stream is Sunday, April 30th at 8 p.m. Central. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. When is this month's, Heather? It is Wednesday, August 26th at 8 p.m. Central. For patrons not in the U.S., you have the option of paying pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. If you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag, like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Shop on the top banner. You can support the show fast, easy, and at no cost to you by rating, reviewing, and following on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Speaking of reviews, you can easily leave one by going to Sinisterhood.com slash reviews. Yours may even be featured on our social media. Have a friend who you think would like us? You can easily share any episode with them by clicking the three dots in the top right corner. You can also share topic-based playlists from Spotify by visiting Sinisterhood.com slash playlist. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod. Like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Check out our TikTok and our YouTube at Sinisterhood Podcast. You can also on our YouTube, in addition to listening to full length episodes, we also have the full video interview up of Vicky Petratus, who was our very first Freaky Friday guest story. And we're going to have another one for you this week. So going forward, we'll be putting the interviews with our our new Freaky Friday pals on our YouTube page. So be sure you head over to YouTube and check it out. It's Sinisterhood Podcast. We're also, speaking of videos, on Cameo. If you have ever asked for us to do a shout out for you, I have some news for you. This is the perfect way to order it. We're going to be able to tell you happy birthday, happy anniversary, a little pep talk for yourself or someone you love. Just go to cameo.com slash Sinisterhood. Let us know who it's for, when you need it, what do you want us to say, and you can book it all right there on Cameo. Christy, where are you at online? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and Twitter and TikTok at Christy or GTFO. Heather? Oh, I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram and TikTok at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Father and Mort rules the devil. <laughs> Keep it creepy. <laughs> hey. 
Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Dallas Krishman. Molly. Lacey Eggersdorfer. Junkyard Dog 2. Jessica Franks. Lily H. Jennifer Urich. Chantel McGuark. Danielle Willoughby. Madison Dorfman. Claudia Most. Alex Othen. Rebecca Walsh. Adriana Reyes. Madeline Moison. Christine. Lauren Keyes. Lori Summers. Rachel Baker. Allison Sickler. Alexandra Hoyle. Jenna Jones. Alexandra Dahl. Haley Boucher. Lori Ann Sarsfield. Sarah Hinkle. Nicole Thurner. Sarah Margison. T. Esper. Megan Long. Connie Smith. Haley Drogas. Stephanie Austellet. Thank you all so much for supporting the show. We could not do this without you. We sincerely appreciate it. And we hope we pronounce your names correctly. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Wah-ha-ha-ha.